Okay, welcome everybody to the seminar on open educational practices for teaching higher education, led by Catherine Cronin from the National University of Ireland, Galway. Um, a number of us in Emerge Africa were very fortunate to have the opportunity to hear Catherine presenting and to meet her and have other conversation at the OE Global Conference in Cape Town earlier this year. Um, so it's really wonderful that she agreed to present for Emerge Africa as well. More people are coming into the room. Um, welcome everyone who's arrived to participate. Antonio, Brenda, Kath, Cheryl, Juliana, Ruth and Stefan. If you just walked in, why not introduce yourself in the text chat, say a little bit about where you work, what you do, where you're from. Um, so we get a sense of who's here across the entire room. And I have no doubt other people will be arriving um, as we go further into the seminar. Um, Catherine's work is focused on openness and open education, digital identity practices, and exploring the boundary between formal and informal learning. She's currently completing her PhD exploring the use of open educational practices in higher ed. Her involvement has been in teaching, research, and advocacy in higher education and in the community for over 25 years. Um, and obviously, this is one of the things that we really like about her work from the Emerge Africa perspective, that Catherine advocates, advocates a critical approach to openness. Um, and it isn't necessarily that the way people do openness is always good or always helpful. And it's good to have these issues opened up. And now over to Catherine, all yours. Okay, uh, is that audio okay? Okay, I hope that's fine. Um, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to join you today. Uh, as, as a couple of you have mentioned while we were getting set up, I met um, some of you from the Emerge Africa Network at the OE Global Conference uh, in March. And uh, it was a, just such a wonderful experience uh, meeting people, a few of whom I had met before, such as Cheryl, who's here, but many, many others who um, I followed your work, I'm aware of you online, but got to meet in person for the first time. So, so it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. And I'm looking forward to the conversation as much as the short presentation which precedes it. Um, I will ask you, Tony, I am very good at uh, being involved in the text chat when I'm a webinar participant, but not so good when I'm a webinar presenter. So um, if there are some big questions or key questions, you might remind me of those at the end when the, when the um, discussion starts. Um, let me see now, I'll advance my slides. I have the links to these slides as well as all of the references that are in the slides um, and some additional re resources on this one Google Doc, which just has the short link OEP hyphen Emerge Africa. So um, everything is there rather than giving you a lot of different links. So hopefully that will be helpful for people um, after the presentation. Uh, an alternate title for this presentation that I have used some time is Choosing Open. And that is because my focus is on choice and agency with respect to openness. And I'd like to, to you know, really open that up for discussion today. I'll share some findings from empirical, re empirical research I've done here in Ireland, um, which is part of my PhD research. And basically I explored whether, why, and how educators choose to use and use open educational practices. Um, and then we'll hopefully use that as a springboard for discussing the issues. Openness is always personal and it's always contextual as, as Tony kicked off there talking about the critical approach. Um, so aware that my experience and the experiences of these educators who I will speak about today at one university in Ireland are not universal. But what I hope to do is just share them um, in the hope that they might open the door to all of us asking some interesting and useful questions um, about openness. And I suppose also about the challenges um, each of us face in our own particular, um, particular context. Uh, I'll start with uh, acknowledging some of the many wonderful researchers and practitioners in this area. I learned from many of them, many of you who are actually here in the webinar, thank you. Uh, so before I go any further, I, I just want to acknowledge and thank 
um, everyone, especially my colleagues in GoGN, which is the global OER graduate network. And the roots of my invitation to join you today are from Nicola and others, Tony and others from Emerge Africa, whom I met at the OE Global Conference. So this is some of the GoGN researchers at the OE Global Conference um, just recently. And if you are doing graduate research or know someone who's doing graduate research in the area of open education, um, I recommend that you check out the GoGN network and, and, and possibly join them. But also, if you are a practitioner, if you're just interested in issues in open education and would like to know the latest research, the GoGN network consists of educators across six continents. It's a, it's a truly global network. And um, that sharing of context and approaches um, is probably one of its um, best assets. Uh, I've, I've learned so much. So I just want to give a shout out and a thanks to all of those uh, wonderful researchers. Oops. Now, uh, something that I learned from my wonderful friend Howard Rangel from many years ago is before we get started, I find it really useful to know where people are. So um, I'm going to put up a set of drawing tools here. And if you'd like to just use the pen tool, the second from the top, and just put an X or a dot or something, um, anything you wish on where you are on the map. It's a global map, so chances are you will, the mark will be very large and might cover your whole area, but that's okay. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of, of who is joining us today. So that second icon from the top is a marker. And you can just click the marker and then click somewhere in the map. Lovely, thank you all so much. So my, my marker has taken up all of Ireland, I see. And we have several people in Africa. Laura, you are in Texas. Lovely. Okay. And for those of you that might not um, get to grips with the drawing tools, you could please do um, say hello if you haven't done so already in the chat. Okay, um, with the advice of uh, Nicola, as we were preparing for this session, Nicola asked me to consider a few questions. And I think you'll see that in, in the first two questions, this whole notion of cho choosing and personal choice um, jump out. So the questions that Nicola invited me to consider were when, why and when educators and educational technology practitioners choose open, and also why not? This is a subject of my research. And in our respective contexts, how can we balance personal choice regarding openness with institutional and other constraints? This is a huge question. Now, obviously, I can't answer the third, um, I can't address the third question, rather. So what I propose is that I will um, share some results of my research related to the first two questions. Um, that'll be reviewing some key concepts, summarizing results of, of my research. And then in the discussion, we might explore <clears throat> Um, some of those ideas in the context of African higher education. Um, why is always a good question to begin with, no matter what the task is. So um, I often like to start presentations with this quote from last year's Opening Up Education report, um, and basically saying open education is a tool for social change. I mean, any of us who are working in this area know that open education can be a powerful tool for many things, network practices, um, learner and institutional development, economic development, social justice, but much more needs to be done in order to, um, to bring those things to fruition. So that means work by the Emerge Network, uh, these conversations that we're having today, and research. And I very much feel that we, we really need to do and share a more empirical and critical research, particularly work with an inequality focus. Um, and we also need imagination, given the times that we're in. Rebecca Solnit, uh, the writer, talks about um, that we need imagination adequate to the possibilities and risks of this moment. And we certainly face many challenges, but um, so that's, that's really where I'm coming from. Now, why did I choose to do research in the area of open educational practices? I have been an open educator and open practitioner for several years. And this graphic I created some years ago just 
to observe what what was happening in higher education in in terms of the learning spaces that we use and that we inhabit. So one could consider three types of learning spaces in higher education: physical spaces like the rooms that we work in, uh, bounded online spaces spaces such as virtual learning environments, learning management systems, anything that you know requires a password to enter that you must be a member, and open online spaces. And I created this diagram using um, a concept that Alec Kuros came up with back in the mid 2000s, this concept of the networked educator. So I see that we as networked educators meet networked students um, in education, and we, we engage in different spaces. And the affordance of, the, of those spaces are, are critical. And in physical spaces and bounded online spaces, it's not possible, or at least it's very difficult to share what we're doing in those spaces out with our networks, my case for educators and students, or to invite those networks into what we're doing in our learning spaces together. In open online spaces, whatever they might be, uh, whether those are you know, social media spaces, blogs, uh, MOOCs, uh, whatever they might be, um, those kinds of connections are, um, are possible. So very few educators are asked to teach in open, line, open online spaces, higher education educators. Now, of course, if you are teaching at an institution with an open education policy and you have the opportunity to develop and teach MOOCs, you might have that opportunity. But on the whole, very few educators currently are asked to teach in those spaces. So the ones who are doing it are choosing to do it. So that's really what I wanted to study. What, what Neil Selwyn and Carrie Facer call the state of the actual of open education. So situated within one institution, um, why do some educators choose to invite students to learn and interact and create um, in open spaces? Uh, why not? So what encourages educators and students? What repels them? What happens there? Um, and really exploring this role of individual agency uh, with respect to OEP. So the title of my um, PhD research study was Openness and Praxis, this notion of reflective praxis of fair race. And my research questions were these, in what ways do academic staff use open educational practices? Why do academic staff use OEP? Why don't they use it? And are there any practices or values or strategies that are shared by open educators? I thought it would be interesting to know that. So um, here's a quote, and I'm just going to invite any of you who, who might want to um, venture a guess as to who or when this, this um, statement might have been made. This is about the definition of openness. The use of the term open by educators in the popular press to describe a wide variety of educational innovations which proliferated at the same time as open education and classrooms were being developed. The, the use of it, open education is sloppy and can be careless. Any, any guesses about who or when that might be? I will share. Um, this is a paper written by Nell Noddings and Scott Enright in 1983. Um, I think it's quite interesting that it's a statement that could be made by any of us today about um, things like open washing and some of the loose statements that are made um, about what open is <clears throat> by various players. Um, another quote is this one. Open learning is an imprecise phrase to which a range of meanings can be and is attached eludes definition, but as an inscription to be carried in a procession on a banner, gathering adherence and enthusiasms, it has great potential. So it's a very imprecision enables it to accommodate many different ideas and aims. <laughs> yes, Tony's state, statement pre predating web by several years indeed. And any um, any suggestions about this one? The second one is actually a quote that's um, that's quoted quite quite often um, by Mackenzie Postgate. Um, and Scotland's UNESCO uh, and Ford Foundation report a book. And as Tony said, um, it predates um, the web by many years and our current definition of open education by many years. And yet, um, in both these cases, open education was defined as um, the advocating social change, uh, radically different teaching methods, and changing education assumptions. So 
I share these definitions just by means of saying that in all of my work, certainly my practical work as an educator, uh, reading other people's research and doing my own research, I think it's important to try and locate the precise definition of openness um, that's being used in the work. So my definition of openness um, is, is this, um, in distilling a lot of work by others, uh, many of whom I'll, I'll mention on a slide in just a few moments, there's kind of four broad interpretations of, of openness in higher education. Starting from the bottom, we, we initially had this notion of open admission, which the open um, universities uh, pioneered. And then some people call open resources anything that's free, anything that you can get online that's free. And then we move up to open educational resources. And these are resources that are intentionally shared for use, adaptation and reuse by others. The yellow line is there to show that, you know, that the definition of openness is, is very much contested there. And finally, um, open educational practices. And open educational practices is, is much more complex. Um, there are two broad families of definitions of OEP. Um, there are OER-focused definitions, which really focus on what we do with OER, um, how we use it, how we reuse it, how we produce it, and so on. And then there's a broader family of definitions um, which relate to open pedagogies, open learning, um, open technologies, respecting and empowering um, learners as co-producers of knowledge, and so on. So, I mean, this is not new. Uh, the original Cape Town Declaration, up 10 years ago, did not mention OEP, but talked about many of the what we now um, call OEP, open sharing of teaching practices, collaborative, flexible learning, and so on. Some of the more recent work, which I have drawn on, um, and I'm delighted that, that Cheryl is here because Cheryl um, has, been, has been a key person that I have learned from in this area. Some work has been done specifically in the area of open educational practices. Um, Helen Beetham reference there relates to the UK OER project. Um, Ellers, um, Cheryl, Hodgkins and Williams, a couple of key papers. Um, but people use many different terms to talk about what we, what we refer to as um, open educational practices. So um, Ella Kuros and others talk about open teaching. Um, there's a growing body of people, particularly in the US and Canada, who talk about open pedagogy. And there's some emerging research there. Um, open scholarship, the um, George Valencianos and Royce Kimmins' key concept of network particip participatory scholarship, which is use of participatory technologies and online social networks for scholarship. Um, and also critical digi digital pedagogy, pedagogy sorry. So I've drawn on a lot of this work in my own work on open educational practices, and I have used the most expansive definition. So more like the definition that um, Helen Beetham and Cheryl have used, which is the creation, use, and reuse of OER and um, pedagogical practices employing participatory technologies and social networks for interaction, peer learning, knowledge creation, and empowerment of learners. All right. The, the second aspect of the definition um, that I talked about is it's important to identify the interpretations of openness that we use, but also what level of openness are we talking about? So um, are we talking about individual activities, someone, for example, using or reusing an OER, or a bit higher level, someone's open practices that they use in general, or, or someone who identifies their openness as a value? Um, or at the highest institutional level, you know, is there an open policy at a particular institution or an open culture? So the terrain of my research is, um, if I were defining it for you, the upper left and the lower to mid right. Um, and hopefully the applicability would be in the upper right um, in hopefully influencing um, institutional policy. Um, briefly, just my methodology is qualitative, interpretive, and critical. Uh, I used constructivist grounded theory and I conducted my study at one higher education institution in Ireland, which does not have <clears throat> or did not have at the time of my research open education policies or an open culture. And I interviewed 19 members of academic staff who varied by discipline, employment status, and their approaches to openness. And the intention there was that because by using a critical approach, I didn't assume the value of openness. I really wanted to study individual meaning making around openness. And I thought it would be very important also to learn from the experiences of educators who are not open. So it was not a study of open educators and what they were doing, 
of people who may have have come to that have come up to that line of considered open practices, and perhaps crossed it or perhaps not. Um, so that was what was interesting to me. And the first findings were just descriptive, kind of painting a picture um, of of academic staff practices. And you know that picture that I have on the slide there is just because I anticipated complexity, and indeed <laughs> it was complex. So what I found was a continuum of practices and values ranging from closed to open and a broad range of educators. So some were open, some were not. Some were moving towards openness and some were not. But all were thinking deeply about their digital and pedagogical practices. So in terms of just a, a snapshot of the, the range of practices, um, this slide summarizes those. So digital networking practices, this is just among the 19 um, members of academic staff. Um, whom I interviewed, uh, ranged from people who whose main digital identity was only university-based, who may only even use their university email um, and not use social media at all, to those on the right with well-developed open digital identities and using social media. Um, again, digital teaching practices ranged from using VLE only to using VLE plus open tools. Um, some individuals, as has emerged in all OER uh, studies that I have seen, um, had little, little or no knowledge of copyright or Creative Commons, um, and others used and reused OER. An interesting point for those of you who are working in OER is in my study, I found no one creating, um, intentionally creating and openly licensing their work. So the, the, the use was reusing and, and using OER. Um, in digital literacies, there was some, uh, a, a digital natives discourse emerged in some senses. I can talk about that in the, in the question period at the end, if you wish. Um, and at the other end, there were academic staff who, who sought to develop their own and their students' digital and network literacies. And in terms of personal values, there were no academic staff in my study who said they did not value privacy. Um, but the attitudes towards privacy ranged from a very strong attachment to people who valued their privacy, but also valued openness and were striving for a balance. And this was actually one of the key findings of the study. And the notion of boundaries was also related to privacy. Some people wanted to have very strict boundaries between their personal and professional identities and interactions, for example, and between um, teacher and student interactions. And others over on the right accepted more porosity um, across those boundaries. So um, in doing kind of further analysis of those results, um, this summarizes kind of some of the key findings. Um, many academic staff, those using OEP and those not perceive potential risks. And I, I don't think that would be surprising for anyone um, for themselves and for their students. And those risks were both pedagogical and practical. So those might be things like academic staff saying they were uncertain of the pedagogical value of open practices, so using social media, for example. Some academic staff thought students overused social media anyway and have no intention of adding to that. Some just talk about their overwhelming workload and how they thought it might be interesting and useful to use open practices, but they had they literally had no time to explore that option. Um, some staff were worried about excessive noise in their social media streams, and others were worried about context collapse, kind of mixing their personal and professional streams. And in terms of the benefits, those who used OEP talked about students feeling more connected, um, connecting their coursework to the broader field, whatever that field might be, law, nursing, software engineering. Um, the, another benefit was students sharing their work openly with an authentic audience, uh, becoming part of a future professional or civic community, and co-creating knowledge. So there, there was just, um, I, had to, I had to really look for um, participants who used open educational practices. It was a minority, but I had to, I had to find those and search, search them out. But there were really, the third bullet there, there were two levels of using open educational practices. The first level used by all eight was people who described being open. They were willing to be visible to their students in open spaces, um, interacting there and sharing beyond video and beyond email. Um, there were a smaller number who also were teaching openly, specifically creating learning and assessment activities in open online spaces. And those might have been things like um, WordPress blogs, um, Twitter, and so on. And then the last question that I explored was 
once I had identified the, the so-called open educators, open educators are, are educators who are using OEPs, um, did they share any um, dimensions, any, any strategies or any qualities? And um, I found four dimensions that were shared by, by um, open educators. So I'll just explore, explain those now. I'll explain the first, the first two first because these are related. Balancing privacy and openness was the primary concern of, um, of the participants in my study. So open educators sought to balance their personal privacy, however they defined that, with gaining the benefits of openness for themselves and their students. Now, some uh, of the participants did not, were not striving for balance, and these were in two categories. One was a few participants had a strong or even fierce notion of personal privacy. Uh, three participants, for example, in my study, had loved ones who had experienced online bullying or stalking. So it wasn't a question of trying to explain or understand the values of openness. They were very clear that they wanted to protect their personal privacy based on their previous experiences um, and weren't willing to explore that any further. Um, another category of those who were not seeking to balance privacy and openness were those who were completely overwhelmed uh, with teaching load, with student numbers, some even to the point of, of anxiety. Um, but for a great many others who weren't in either of those categories, there was this notion of trying to balance the personal um, the privacy and openness. And this notion of boundaries came up again and again. And this has emerged in other studies as well, um, the, between the personal and the private and between students and teachers. And the particular challenges are along that boundary, that liminal space between the personal and the professional, for example. So, so Individuals talked about this boundary, smudging the boundary out and redrawing it. Um, and these are instances like, um, just as in offline interactions where coworkers become friends. So if, if um, individuals spoke about you know, saying that they Facebook is only for personal and Twitter is only for professional, well then what happens when our, when our coworkers become our friends? Well then should we accept their Facebook friend requests? Also, some interesting um, rules that people made about students, about not friending students, again, on Facebook. Most of the participants said that they have a rule, a personal rule, that they don't friend undergraduates on Facebook. Um, but what about PhD students? So, well, then, you know, I would friend PhD students, but not my own PhD student. <laughs> so there was this constant litany of, of creating rules and negotiating those rules and almost on a daily basis based on on connections that they were either initiating or that others were initiating with them in open spaces. So a lot of the strategies that individuals employed um, to assert these boundaries were using things like privacy settings, using different tools for different purposes. Um, as I mentioned, maybe Facebook for personal, Twitter for professional, uh, sometimes maintaining two different Facebook accounts, one personal and one professional. So you can see the links here with developing digital literacies. So those individuals who had a sense of developing their digital literacies had access to a lot of these skills and tools in order to achieve a balance between privacy and openness. And um, again, as I mentioned before, digital literacies, there was a whole range of reactions to that. There was a good number of individuals who said they would like to develop better digital identities and digital literacies, but said that you know, time was an issue and there was a certain element of guilt around that um, in, in some cases. And the other two dimensions were valuing social learning and challenging traditional teaching role expectations. So most of the participants said that they valued social learning, that they try and um, initiate social learning um, among students in whatever learning spaces they teach in, whether there's are classrooms, in VLEs, or wherever. But the educators who used OEP really valued social learning to the point of social network learning. So all of the educators who used OEP um, um, said this. The most difficult category that I found to define was the, that green segment, challenging traditional teaching role expectations. But uh, this was very important and separated um, some participants out. So in the first instance, um, the, we had teachers who identified themselves as learners, who, had, who expressed a certain level of humility around um, being wrong about being seen as a learner, you know, for example, joining a Twitter chat, asking questions, so not feeling like they had to have all the answers. Um, others talked about a commitment to democratic practices, 
the openness, not just as a practice, but as an ethos. So this often went hand in hand with valuing social learning, but not always. Um, but there were also some structural reasons for challenging traditional teaching while expectations. So, and I, I in discussing my research with others, I, I come back to this point quite often, and that is it's sometimes easy to make assumptions about why people do or don't use open educational practices, but it is complex and it is personal. And I have a couple of quotes here to show what I mean by that. So first is um, a participant. This person had the first three dim dif dimensions, but not the fourth one. So it was very active um, on Twitter and blogger and very digitally literate, valued social learning, but does not see teaching in open spaces as part of his role as a teacher. So there was no discussion as part of um, professional development about what it means to be an educator in increasingly networked and participatory culture and whether that should or should not be um, part of our role. And the second, um, this is someone who was precariously employed by the university on a series of short-term contracts. And he did not intentionally set out to interact with his students on Twitter, but as you can see from the quote here, um, did not have access to university email between um, periods where he was teaching. So where he used his Gmail account, he had his Twitter name and the footer from students connected with him, and that opened up a whole new area for him of using open spaces um, and using open educational practices. Um, so this is an example of you know something that was initiated by really something very structural, um, not someone who um, either had used OER before or who was um, making a decision based on an open policy um, or advice from anyone else. And finally, just the postscript on the bottom right hand corner there, and then, the, and then I'll finish up because I'd like to have some time for, for discussion, is um, the inner circle um, relates at two levels. So the outer circle, valuing social learning and traditional teaching role expectations, um, relates to our roles as networked educators. But the inner circle, we really have to deal with at two levels. So what I mean by this is some professional development um, for educators in higher education helps um, individuals to develop their digital literacies and uh, figure out how to balance privacy and openness and so on. But doing this as an individual is different than doing this as a teacher. So how do we develop our own digital literacies, but how do we embed digital literacies in you know, our teaching? And likewise, balancing privacy and openness. How do we do that ourselves? And how do we design learning activities so we can help students to do that in ways that are that are safe and useful. So I think this points to you know kind of some of the actions that we can take from these understandings. And one last finding before I wrap up, um, and that was um, much of the work that's been done already talks about how OER use leads to OEP use. So um, it, OEP can emerge from OER, and really an emergent finding from my study was that um, the opposite can happen as well. So the relation between OER and OEP is, is more complex, perhaps, than previously considered. There's, for example, I, the way I see it is that there's a lower threshold for emergent forms of OEP, like connecting with students in open spaces, opening the classroom via social media. So awareness and motivation for OER can be driven by those emergent forms of OEP. And you know, I've been so enthused in the last few months to learn that this is not just a finding from my research in Ireland, but it's, it's emerging in other places as well. So a recent paper <clears throat> coming from UCT um, by Laura Chernewicz, Michael Deacon, Sakina Welge, and Michael Glover um, on MOOCs and open practices also reveals this. Um, and also, in particular, uh, Glenda Cox's work and I cite Glenda's recent paper there with Henry Trotter, but um, her PhD work as well. Um, the, their paper looked at how the interrelations of structure, culture, and agency shape behavior. Um, and they looked at this with relation to OER, and I'm finding a similar um, finding with relation to OEP. So in other words, institutional culture um, and practice can mediate the role um, that policy plays um, in academic decision-making. So 
you know, all of these connections that I talked about at the start of the presentation are very exciting because um, we realized that, you know, these findings were not in isolation. These are emerging in very different contexts. So to wrap up, um, I just want to highlight um, that the first pink segment that I shared in, in that wheel was this notion of balancing privacy and openness. Participants' interpretation of these and the relationship between them was the most outstanding finding of my study. This is what people talked about more than anything else. And the way that individuals described this was as individual work. Um, so again, this was an institution without an open policy, but people talked about this as work that they have to do. They have to create rules and it's also continual. So these individual decisions about um, balancing their personal values, their experiences, their digital literacies um, in the particular context they find themselves in. So um, some quotes that, that highlight that are, are these. There are no hard and fast rules. People made many, many comments similar to that. I have personal rules for that. This notion of creating personal rules and negotiating them all the time um, came out again and again. And um, one tool that I developed as part of the research that's been useful in my work with academic staff was this. And I found this to be a helpful framework for understanding the complex negotiations that, um, that many participants describe when they make decisions about whether and how um, to use OEP. So there's four, if, if we think about four levels of, of kind of balancing privacy and openness or negotiating openness, is the, the macro level is, will I share? Um, you know, do I want to share openly, whether that's you know, my research or my teaching or, or whatever that might be? And some people say no at that level. Um, but the, for the people who say yes here, saying yes, I consider sharing openly, most of the hard work is done at the three levels beneath this. So at the meso level um, is who will I share with and who do I not want to share with and dealing with this whole notion of context collapse. Um, at the micro level, um, this is where individuals are dealing with notions of identity, digital identity, their voice, who will I share as? So, you know, when I, for an individual, say who, an educator who wants to start to use Twitter, for example, or blogging, um, who am I speaking as? Am I speaking as the lecturer? Am I speaking as a mother? Am I speaking as a citizen? Do I want to combine those, make them separate, and so on? And the nano level is at the individual level of interaction. Will I share this? So, a, you know, an individual post, tweet, retweet, tag, or whatever. And what's interesting is the meso and the micro work often goes on at the beginning of someone's work as an open practitioner, but the nano work goes on all the time. So the expression that I use to describe this is, is that usage doesn't seem to inoculate one from, from this work. So unfortunately, most professional development is at the macro level. And it's, you know, perhaps teaching people how to get to grips with blogging or, or using Twitter or whatever it might be. Um, whereas opening up some of these questions, like at the mesor and micro level, helps people get past um, the barriers that they really face, not the mechanics of how to use a, a particular tool, but, you know, who, who am I? Who will I share as when I use these tools? And, and who will I share with? Um, and supporting people in, in addressing those questions um, can be really useful. So a uh, final note, just that cr the notion of a critical approach to openness was essential for me. Uh, it, was, it was essential for my research, but I think it's also essential for all open research and open policies because we can recognize the value of openness and open education on a macro kind of institutional and societal level, but we really need to keep our focus on individuals situated in specific contexts. And, and I mean, students, um, academics, and, and all staff and wider publics, not just in our own immediate areas, but globally. And, and really, I think that, that attention to what openness means for individuals in particular context is, is the key to um, critical approaches. And um, an example of this is just a, a, a great blog post that, that Martin Weller wrote uh, last December, I think it was, where he talked about this conundrum, that it's never been more risky to operate in the open, but it's never been more vital to operate in the open, these paradoxes of open scholarship. There are so many challenges, but if we opt out as individuals and as educators, we do not have a voice in networked publics. 
so um, I expected complexity in when I did this research, and that's exactly what I got. But it helped me to illuminate some possible paths forward, and probably to conclude, uh, you know, just to conclude my research and this presentation. That's a summary of it, really, in one slide. Um, and I think that despite the challenges, I I remain committed to um, open education, uh, teaching, research, and policy with a critical lens. Um, I think it's a way of helping learners and helping more learners realize their potential. But I also think that through this work, um, we can improve society and work towards uh, social justice outcomes. And I remain hopeful. Uh, so I'll end with this quote by Rebecca Solnit. And I am delighted to um, open up for discussion. Catherine, thank you very much for the presentation. If anything, I think it was even better than the presentation you did at OE Global. Um, and thank you very much for remaining hopeful and researching and acting on that hopefulness. I'm going to pick up on a few of the questions and comments that came up in the text chat. Um, and firstly, um, yeah. Laura was very interested in the idea of chatting a bit more about boundaries and context collapse between people who are working with academics and people like her working with non-academic staff. And I'm wondering if you can just say a little bit more about your experience of working at the boundary between privacy and openness. OK. Um, I love the way that you frame that question because it is, uh, you know, as I, as I have in, I'll go back to the slide here. Uh, our use of OEP is always personal and always contextual. So I can, I can answer that question for me personally in my context. And certainly my, my boundaries did evolve over time. So at the very beginning when I started using open tools, I, I was very clear that I would use them in a professional sense and I would not my personal life would not bleed in. So a lot of this resonated with me um, when, when people described that. And over time, um, I became a little more um, a little more forgiving about those boundaries, as many of us do when we start using open practices. And again, this is because relationships develop that we don't anticipate when we start using open tools. And a, a metaphor that I've, I've used with colleagues and in workshops in the past is this notion of building a pointillist portrait of someone. So when we use social media, when we first use it and someone says, oh, just tweet anything, you know, we're putting a dot there and that one dot represents everything about us. And the second dot represents very much also. And when you've been using open tools for a long time, all those dots build up to a very rich portrait. So people that I've been following in their blogs or on Twitter for a long time, I have a very good sense of who they are from following all those dots um, over time, kind of their personality, um, their values, their sense of humor. But I think we, when we've been open practitioners for a while, and we and we we are very light about sharing with people who are new to open practices, we forget that those first couple of dots mean an awful lot because they're everything. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of having that sensitivity when people are new to open practices, I think is really important, whether those people are academic staff, support staff, students, or, or whomever. I'm not sure if that I think it does, the and it also addresses the question about your own practices and experience. Um, next, there was a comment from Antonio, who said, we are left with a simple question, really. Do we take the risks and deal with whatever comes ahead of holding back and never develop? And I think you've clearly answered that question from your perspective. The answer obviously is, yes, we take those risks. Yes, we have to move into this new terrain. Um, but I'm also thinking that in many contexts, moving into this new terrain leaves certain people out on a limb as potentially isolated pioneers um, without collegial or institutional support. Would you like to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I would. And indeed, that was one of my rationales for undertaking this research in the first place, was because I very much perceived that tension of the few individuals who, who believe it's very important to, to undertake this work, but are really 
working out on limb, as you say. And, you know, I did speak with people who said, you know, I don't know if I make a mistake if the university will have my back and I, and perhaps they won't. Um, but also at an institutional level, I think we're abdicating our responsibility if we don't do this work. And by that, I mean that, you know, I, I often would say to students that I was working with that, you know, when they leave the, the university, um, it would be wonderful if they have a qualification and great friends and learned a lot and, and great memories. Um, but they should also have kind of an, a personal learning network so that they continue to learn. Um, students are going out to practice, you know, to be citizens, uh, professionals, whatever they may be, when they leave higher education in networked publics, in increasingly networked and participatory culture. And if we don't provide them the opportunities to address those challenges in the time that they spend in higher education, then I truly think that is abdicating our responsibilities. Um, as educators. So that person who might have a social work qualification will go out after they have their degree and possibly in the first week that they work may get a Facebook friend request from a client. So what do they do? How, you know, how do they answer that question? What's, what, you know, what are the, what's the context within which to consider that question? Who might they go to for support? You know, if we've never explored that, um, then we have failed in, in terms of an institution. So. So if this is work that the institution must do, then we really need to help build the capacity of both staff and students. I don't think every member of staff is required to use open practices, nor every student, but I think we need to help build that capacity and provide opportunities um, for, for all um, you know, to develop in this space. Um, because of the okay, thank you, Catherine, that we all live that in. answer. Um, there's a question that came from Cheryl, which was, I would like to know if you're, study has surfaced any collaboration as an OEP among staff at the university? Yes. Um, I was just doing some writing about this this weekend, actually. And one of the notions of, and I'd be interested to know, Cheryl, to see if, how this arises in your own work. But in this particular study, one of the um, one of the bedrock foundations of becoming an open practitioner was having an open network digital identity and a network. Um, and very often uh, that network was used to, to help embolden individuals in their practice. Um, but often again, it led to collaboration um, in many, many different ways. So, so some of the open educators um, talked about having you know stronger connections with people in their networks who might be geographically very dispersed than with people who they were co-located with um, you know, in their own, um, in their own uh, universities. And that went for, for people who were doing research and teaching. So I don't know, does that resonate at all with what, what work you have done or? Yeah. So of course, I'm sure I was also commenting a bit in the text chat and I think you're finding a certain resonance mm. there. Um, I'll throw in one of my questions, which is, at a level of personal choice yeah. and at a level of professional development activities, are there any obvious trajectories for educators who might want to transform their practices and identities to become networked educators? So I'm not sure of the question. Okay, so you've got these educators um, who are thinking, um, I'm not quite sure if I've got what it takes to become a network mm. educator, but I'd really like to give it a go. Um, is there any particular mm -hmm. trajectory that would help them to do that? Mm -hmm. And how could professional development work within their context, possibly by their university system? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Um, okay, um, that gets back to, I mean, this, what helps me answer that question is what I learned about the dimensions shared by open educators. So um, if we are helping educators build their digital capacity, their, their digital literacies, and particularly in the area of balancing privacy and openness, because once we engage in open practices, once we engage in open practice, it's personal right? Because we're using our networked open 
identity and not our institutional rural identity. So the inner circle, um, professional development in that area is key. The green segment there is also really important. So I have not seen in the context that I did this research, any professional development which relates to the role of educators in addressing the challenges of, as I said, increasingly networked participatory culture. How is our role as an educator changing? So yes, we are develop we're building capacity and skills and using tools and so on. But unless we talk about what that identity and what the role is of, of educators in the institution um, in, in these broadly changing contexts, um, then I don't think we're fully supporting um, that, that staff capacity um, in order to enable greater openness. It certainly so I, I sounds like a, one that needs attention. Um, Antonio picked up on a different side of the challenges mm -hmm. and suggested that perhaps students need some training regarding online conduct and the risks of participating in open networks. Um, and that might be as important as educators changing their practices. Yes, indeed, I, I, I agree 100%. And what I, what I didn't explore here was uh, just because of time, and but I, I will be writing it up in my next paper, is I did um, have follow-up interviews with some of these open educators and then surveyed their students because I really wanted to know, well, then if these are the open educators and these are their intentions of, of using OEP, well, then what happens <laughs> when they invite students? Are the students inclined to accept those invitations? If so, why? If not, why not? Um, and then what happens there? So yes, I agree. The the the, the different all of the different pieces of this are equally important the educator perspective and the student perspective um, but the, the the open educators who who I spoke with in this study many of them took on board the responsibility to to discuss and practice digital and network literacies in the context of their teaching because they recognize just that so some just talked about it, about the importance of what you share and where you share and digital identity. And some did it in a, in a practice-based way. So having open Twitter chats or, or setting up um, uh, courses in, in WordPress blogs and inviting different people to come in so that where things happened, they could then um, reflect on, on, on those things that happen. You know, how does anonymity work in online open spaces? Um, how do you use um, privacy settings, um, what happens when you have an unwanted interaction with someone, those kinds of things. So yes, we need support for both students and staff to explore those. Okay, colleagues, we're getting towards the end of the seminar. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone wants to post closing comments in the text chat. Could be questions, could be speculations, could be deep insights. Um, because the bridge we haven't been able to make yet is the question of what this means for us in the context of African universities. And I think there's a lot of reflect and reflection and engagement required for that. Meanwhile, Catherine, is there a particular closing comment that you'd like to make? Um, I I suppose my, my closing comment is, I mean, I wish we there could be more discussion if anyone um, wants to continue discussion, you know, if you're blogging or um, I will certainly blog uh, after this session myself, I would love to continue the discussion. But um, I would say eyes wide open is, is my best advice. So we, we sometimes must convince our institutions that um, a, that it's important to be open, but B, that it's important to be open and recognize the complexities. So, and this is something that I've seen, you know, where, where institutions do get on board with openness. Sometimes they use, use a very broad brush, brush approach and don't recognize the complexities around the personal, the contextual, the differences for different students and different educators. Um, so supporting one another is key, but I also think, um, educating and um, advocating within our institutions is also key so you know those of us who have experience in these practices need to be 
in the rooms and part of the um, creation of, of the policies around um, these. I Catherine, I want to thank you for a most engaging um, and informative and often quite inspiring presentation and really want to appreciate the um, context sensitivity that you brought to the discussion um, and the way that you actually span that range from the very nano right through to the very macro level of institutional policies and assumptions that are required to support individual educators and open educational practices. Um, I suspect that this conversation is going to have um, very um, good repercussions for many who are currently in the room. I'm hoping that we will find a way to continue that conversation into what does this mean for us in our African universities. Yes, and um, several cheers to you and thanks to everybody who's been here and participating and sharing your thinking and your insights.